stone of God's judgment as he executes judgments on all the gods of Egypt and upon all the sinful Egyptians, especially Pharaoh. <laughs> Exodus 12, we'll read the first 30 verses. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood, and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you, on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, on the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. <laughs> For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land, you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your plans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. And touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. 
where he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. At midnight, the Lord Yahweh struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. So for the reading of God's word, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open to Exodus 12, because we're going to be referring to it a number of times this morning. Although fewer people self-identify as Christians in our culture, spiritual conversations are still important, and they are always going to happen in any culture, especially questions about guilt. Take back to a conversation I still had a number of years ago, the striking of a conversation with a stranger on a train of all places. And it came out that I was an administrator studying for it. And uh, he said, well, what do, you, what do you do about guilt? <clears throat> People are still made in the image of God. And they have the law of God imprinted on their conscience. And so this question of breaking the law and the guilt that comes from that is still always going to be an issue with people. What do I do about this guilt that I feel? Now, there are a few common attempts to deal with that guilt that we see around us. Uh, probably the main, the preference of many is to deny guilt. Say you shouldn't feel guilty. And basically they try to redefine right and wrong. So basically they say the things that you think you're doing wrong aren't really wrong at all. They're fine. You shouldn't feel guilty about that. Uh, that seems to be very popular today. It, thus it has always been, but certainly today we call evil good and good evil. That's how some people try to deal with that guilt. Uh, a second way is similar. Uh, they say, okay, I know I did some bad things, but... What came out of it, what I was trying to do, the ends justify the means. So, therefore, even though I know I didn't do exactly what I prefer to do, in the end it was worth it. And so they try to justify themselves by saying the end goal was worth what I had to do to get there. It's also very common. Others deal with that guilt that they feel by becoming religious. Uh, the largest uh, Christian or the largest Christian organization, not necessarily a church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they would say that you need to admit guilt to a priest. And you try to balance out the bad behavior with good deeds. You cooperate with God's grace and you try to balance the scales. And so the guilt that you feel should motivate you to do good, to try to balance it out and cancel it out by the grace of God. Those are three very common ways that people deal with guilt in our culture today. But the real prescription to deal with and get rid of the guilt is found in God's Word, the Bible, and specifically in Exodus chapter 12. You say, I don't remember reading about guilt. Well, first, we need to understand that we feel guilty because we are guilty. Now that doesn't mean that every time we feel guilty we've done something wrong, but in general we feel guilt because we have offended God's righteous decrees, and because we are made in the image of God we know that we have offended Him. Romans 1 is very clear that God puts His law on our hearts, the law of conscience. So even though people have uh, different consciences, they still know that because what they're doing is not right, it's not good. 
And therefore, these, all these attempts to deal with guilt aren't going to necessarily work well. To redefine bad behavior or rationalize it is not going to work because there's still the underlying cause that we've offended a holy God. So then, the solution, secondly, is we need to see what God says about getting rid of guilt. And we look for that in the Bible. Now, we start our quest this morning in Exodus 12 by reading about leaven. Now, kids, you might wonder, what is leaven? It's not something that we usually talk about much. I think uh, a better word to, means the same thing, is uh, yeast. That also isn't a word that we uh, deal with a whole lot, but what is yeast or leaven? Well, if your mom or your dad like to bake bread, uh, you probably have seen leaven. My mom used to get uh, envelopes of yeast, and it was this powdery grainy stuff that you put in the, the dough, the wheat and the flour, and you add the yeast to that. And what would happen is, this little tiny ball of dough, after the yeast would work itself through it for a couple hours, would get bigger and bigger, magically it seemed, and it would grow to double or triple its size. And what happens is, I guess the yeast, I'm, I'm obviously not a scientist, but when you add the water and the flour to the yeast, the yeast breaks apart the starch molecules, and that releases gases, which then makes the dough expand, and that's what makes the bread into this a lot airy, puffy, white substance that we like. What's happening is it's decomposing the elements, and that decomposition is what creates the gases that then makes the, the loaf expand. So yeast is really important for when we do our baking, and that's what the Bible is talking about here, about leaven. And that's what God commanded to remove from the household of the Israelites, all yeast or leaven. So decomposition is associated with this leaven or yeast. And this is mentioned quite a bit with the Passover feast. Let's take a look at verse 8, verse 15, and then 17 through 20 in Exodus 12. Verse 8 we read there, They shall eat the flesh of the lamb that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread. And bitter herbs they shall eat it. Again, bread without leaven. Verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day to the seventh, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And then, 17 through 20, you shall observe the feast of what? Unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. There shall, therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations. And then verse 18 says, You shall eat unleavened bread. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. It repeats, If anyone eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Verse 20, You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. I have a recurring theme, right? Very important, God tells Israel, no yeast at all in your houses, and you certainly shall not eat food with any yeast in it. It's pretty clear that the people of Israel were commanded to get rid of all yeast for the Passover. Well, why? Does God hate yeast? No, I mean, God made yeast, and, and it's fine to use yeast or leaven in our baking. But for Israel, it was wrong to use it, because yeast or leaven, as the agent which decomposes, is a picture or a symbol of sin. Now, not all Jewish commentators, a lot of Jewish commentators that I read actually said, we don't know why there's this prohibition against yeast, but post-biblical evidence does refer to yeast as referring to sin. And Paul in the New Testament certainly uses the word leaven or yeast to imply uh, it certainly has connotations of sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, Your boasting is not good. 
Do you not know that a little yeast or leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul, giving a commentary on the significance of leaven at the Passover, he clearly says that leaven is a symbol or a picture of sinfulness. Therefore, if that's what's going on here, God doesn't care so much about leaven getting rid of it today. That's not the point. The point here is that it's a picture of sin. And God commands every household to completely rid itself of that symbolic imagery of sin. It's a picture then of God's holiness and his wrath against sin. And it's very clear based on how strict and firm and adamant God is that God cannot tolerate sin and the Israelites must get rid of it. Now, let's go back to our question about guilt. You might say, well, that's the problem, isn't it? We are sinful, we are guilty. How do we get rid of it? If only it was as easy as looking for yeast and making sure it's cast out of our house, right? That's something that's doable. But how do we undo something in the past that we did? How can we get rid of these terrible wrongs that we've done to our neighbor or to, uh, to our God? How do we deal with that? Lady Macbeth, the cry of out, out, black spot, is the problem, isn't it? We don't know how to get rid of the yeast, as it were, the sin in our lives, and that's why we have guilt. So then the question is, we know we have to get rid of the sin, the yeast, but how? Well, the second element, the key part of the Passover, actually, is connected to the removal of yeast. And the second part of the Passover, the first part is what? Get rid of all the yeast and the unleavened, and make sure everything is unleavened. That's the first element. But what's the second element of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Passover? The second part is the shedding of blood, the death of the Lamb. And that also is a very prominent theme in our text. So let's take a look at verse 3, and then verse 6, and verse 7. Other references, of course. But verse 3, we read there, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb, according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household, and then verse 6, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood of those lambs and put the blood of the lamb on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Now each household, note, well, not only does each household have to get rid of the yeast, but each household also has to participate because there are guilty people, leaven as it were, stained with sin, who would normally be subject to God's wrath against sin. And specifically, the destroying angel that he is sending to bring his judgment on all those in Egypt. And it's very clear that every household in Egypt will be struck by the wrath of God. But it's also implied here that every household in Israel who didn't follow God's prescription to escape guilt would also be struck. It's not that the Israelites were inherently morally better people, that they were just righteous completely, and the Egyptians were a bunch of scoundrels. No. The difference between each Egyptian house and each house of Israel is how they respond to the wrath of God and his destroying nature. Because everyone's guilty. Everyone is a rebel against God's law. 
And that's where the Passover makes sense here, because each household of Israel was to take that spotless lamb, a year old lamb without blemish, kill it, burn it, and before that, place its blood, the sign of the life of the lamb and the death of the lamb. Place that blood on the doorpost of the house. Friends, what we see here in this great Passover feast is this principle of the substitute. It's clear from our text that Israel, according, well, not from our text in Exodus 12, but for all that we've read about Israel, Israel deserves to die, just like the Egyptians do. But God commanded that a lamb be killed in place of the guilty Israelites. So if an armed gunman comes in here and, and points a gun at someone in the front row and is about to kill him, but someone else says, no, wait, shoot me instead, let that person go free. That's what we see here is this principle of the substitute. The lamb dies in place of the guilty Israelites. Someone's going to die when the destroying angel comes close. When the advent of God and his wrath comes, people are going to die. The good news here for Israel is that the lamb was killed instead of the guilty people. And not just did they have to kill the lamb, but they had to take the blood of that substitute, the dead lamb, and they had to put the sign of that death on the doorposts of, doorposts of their houses. And once the reality of the death of the Lamb was displayed, that's when the destroying angel saw the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost, and only then would it pass over that house and spare the guilty people inside. Because the substitute died in place of the guilty Israelites. Verse 13, verse 23, let's take a look at our text. Verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, the Lord said, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. See that, verse 13? When I see the blood of the land, I will pass over you, and no wrath of time will befall you. Because the Lamb has taken the wrath. Verse 23, you see that repeated. For the Lord Yahweh will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord Yahweh will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. By the way, there's this great theme throughout the Pentateuch about the Houses. There is salvation behind the door. We see in Noah in the ark, it says, when Noah and his family were in the ark, God shut the door and there's destruction and death outside. When the Lord came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, it says the angel pulled Lot inside the door, and that's when they, they were able to escape. But there was death outside the door. Here we see outside the door, God executes his wrath on the Egyptians, but all who are behind the door, marked by the blood of the Lamb, they are spared. This great theme of the door is all throughout the Old Testament. And then it's ultimately fulfilled in the person of Christ in John 10, when he says, I am the door. He who enters through me shall find life. Just a great theme. But also, not just do we see this theme of the door, but you see, friends, that guilty people can only escape wrath if another dies in their place. And just as yeast or leaven is a symbol of man's sin, so the Passover lamb is a symbol of God's great substitute. Because actually, a lamb to spare a household of guilty people, it doesn't make much sense. It's not a big trade-off, is it? But it's because the lamb in itself had no power 
the lamb pointed ahead to the ultimate great substitute, who did have power when his blood was shed. And of course, that is the Lamb of God, none other than Jesus Christ, is it not? That's what John the Baptist testified. John chapter 1, verse 25, he says what? Behold, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Passover Lamb. He is the great substitute. This whole idea of substitute is all throughout Scripture. Later on in the Gospel of John, John chapter 11, verses 50 through 52, we read there, uh, this is from Caiaphas, the high priest, Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And the high priest did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die on behalf of the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Jesus is the substitute. He is the Passover lamb. And beautifully, friends, as the Passover lamb when was Jesus' blood shed? Remember, it was just after the celebration of the Passover. He celebrated the Passover feast with his disciples and then was betrayed and tried and crucified right on the eve. He was slain at twilight. And he was consumed and burned up, as it were, by the wrath of a holy God against our sin. That was placed upon him. And the good news of the gospel is that as the substitute, Jesus Christ turned aside God's wrath against our sin. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God made him, that is Christ, who had no sin, the spotless lamb, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 John 2, verse 2. Jesus Christ is the propitiation. He is the one that turns aside the wrath of God. He is the one who causes God's wrath to pass over us. And so, friends, when we deal with guilt, we cannot get rid of our sin ourselves. It is only the death of the substitute. It is only Christ's death that can turn aside the wrath of God because he took the wrath that we should have taken. The good news of the gospel, friends, is that by trusting in Christ the substitute to save you, he not only turns aside the wrath of God by paying the penalty that we owe, but he also takes all your sin. The death of the substitute that is the key to the removal of all of these. And it's only the death of the substitute that is able to do that. And so, friends, it is truly in Jesus Christ, the Passover Lamb, that as Colossians 1, verse 22 says, you are now holy and blameless in God's sight. The blameless, spotless Lamb of God was so that you would be holy and blameless in the sight of God. Where does that leave us, friends? The substitute is the gospel. And we can point people to Christ as the only way to truly solve guilt. He is the only one who takes God's wrath that we deserve. It's just. God doesn't just look over sin. He punishes it, but he punished it in the other, in Christ. The substitute is the solution for guilt. And that's what we need to point people toward. Secondly, we've talked about sin and blood and God's justice. But ultimately, doesn't this show the love of God to all those who 
one thing. That God sent his son to be the great substitute. His own beloved son. So that guilty people like me and you who are full of yeast and sin. We can escape God's just wrath. It's the love of God in Christ. And so we see the justice of God here, but we also see the love and the mercy of God. And that's what we also need to declare to our friends and to rejoice in ourselves. The love of God for us in Christ. <coughs> and finally, when we see not only the justice, but the mercy and the love of God in Christ, what can we do but praise him? He is worthy of our praise. And that's why we gather together as his people for our visit. We saw last week that uh, the start of the calendar, as it, as it were, the Lord's Day, is the focus of the shedding of the blood of the Passover lamb. When we see the love of God, we are called to shout hallelujah and praise him. Let's go before God's well in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have had mercy upon us, that you have sent the substitute. And it was at great cost to yourself, for our, our Lord Jesus was perfect and spotless and pure. And he completely obeyed you, Father, in all things. Truly, he was the one who was your beloved son, in whom you were well pleased. And yet, it was your son that you sent to be the substitute. We thank you for the love that you have shown us in Christ. And we pray that if we are struggling with guilt, that we would remember that it's the death of the substitute that truly turns aside your wrath, that you have settled account. Therefore, because of Christ, we are holy and blameless in your sight. We thank you for loving us so much in Christ. And we pray that if there's anyone here that has never trusted in Christ, that this would be the day or the week that they come to you and they say, Lord, thank you for loving me, a sinner who does not deserve your love. Please save me by the blood of Jesus. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior and our substitute. In Jesus' name.